What's up guys? Today I'm sharing some stuff that I bought at a local garage sale. I was uh, actually pretty lucky to get there before the sale even started. I responded to an ad of someone who was selling um, a bunch of hunting stuff. That's what they put in their ad. And I thought, all right, hunting stuff. That's cool. I'm not a hunter, as far as anyone knows. I happen to have a fur trapper's license. Maybe that's a story for another day. Uh, I have hunted out of necessity, but because of an old video about squirrels, I don't talk about that on YouTube anymore. Maybe someone who's watched the channel for a long time can explain that. But long story short, uh, I ended up at this guy's house. I was looking through a bunch of the stuff. Uh, the story was that his uh, uh, hunting buddy of like 35 years passed away, and he was selling all this stuff for his spouse, which I thought was really nice. Um, there was a bunch of guns originally that was going to be for sale, but then the spouse decided they were going to give it to the grandkids, you know, so I totally understand that. Uh, but he did have this one here, okay, which technically there's no guns on the table. I know you're looking at guns, but none of them are guns according to the federal government. Uh, this is a CO2 gun from Crossman, shoots BBs, put that off to the side. And this one is actually a spring-loaded gun from Marksman. This is a gun that uh, I used to have with my father. We used to shoot darts out of this thing. This thing is awesome. All right, so basically when you pull this back, you're just cocking a large spring, you're setting it, and then on the front here, you push up and you can load this with .177 pellets or darts. Now, I always use this literally with a dartboard, and they're tiny little darts, and I used to play darts with the gun, which I thought was really cool. Now, those are really cool freebies, but I'm not focusing on those in this video. I'm focusing on these two knives, as well as that. Now that is also not considered a gun, even though it does fire a fairly large round. This is a Lyman, well really it's a Vest Arms, all right, which is an Italian company. They also produce guns under the name Lyman. And this is basically a replica of a Hawkins rifle. All right, this is a uh, flintlock gun. This is 50 caliber. Uh, black powder. I have no experience with black powder. I've doing a lot of homework lately. You guys will definitely see a video on this in the future uh, Shooting it because I think it's going to be a lot of fun black powder rifles have been something I've always kind of had on the back burner I really kind of want to get into them But there's a lot going on with it in this particular case the guy happened to have the gun and all the stuff that went with it I mean everything that I would need to actually shoot this uh, again, I just really want to educate myself fully on black powder. It is very important uh, to do things properly, to get the right powders. I mean, something like uh, priming the pan here, uh, it's a separate powder than what actually goes, you know, as the charge. The whole thing's really interesting. I've been really learning a lot about it. You guys know, you know, I have a lot of hobbies. Uh, firearms is a hobby, but this is a hobby within a hobby. Black powder is totally its own thing. So I really just want to educate myself fully on the subject, really know what I'm doing so I can enjoy it safely. And then eventually you guys will see a video on shooting it because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, actually, one of my favorite old movies because of my father is Jeremiah Johnson. If you've never seen Jeremiah Johnson, definitely worth checking out. Uh, it's a mountain man story. And uh, this particular gun is, I think, one of the three guns that are in the movie. He also has um, a planes rifle, I think. I think it's a 30 caliber. But he has a Hawkins-style um, rifle. The flintlock muzzle loaders were very popular in the 1820s to I think the late 1840s. Eventually it was replaced with uh, percussion. Uh, I actually, I'm learning a lot about it. I'm not going to pretend like I know everything, so I'm going to stop talking about it in a moment. Uh, but what I did learn, which is fascinating, is that the American Indians preferred the flintlock just because there might be shortages of different parts and stuff. But with this, they always had access to flints. And you can even use something like chert to create a spark. Uh, so all they really needed with one of these rifles is just a source for black powder. So even long after percussion took over, American Indians still preferred this particular rifle. But this rifle and the Plains rifle was the, uh, the main guns of their time period and the number one gun used by fur trappers and fur traders at the time. So there's just a ton of history behind this particular style of muzzle loader, and uh, it's just really interesting. But again, I'm gonna stop talking about it because I'm all new to it, so I'm not gonna you know, speak like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's just, like I said, because it's all new to me, it's all very exciting and stuff. I'm gonna focus on these knives, because I know knives. So, I saw these two. He had actually a big box of knives, and there was a bunch of other things. You know, there's a couple knives there that I liked as well. Um, there's probably 30 or so altogether. They were old hunting knives. They were all dirty. They were all, you know, lightly covered in rust. They had some issues here and there. Uh, but because I was focused on the muzzle loader so much, I kind of took my focus away from the knives because I wasn't planning on spending a bunch of money to begin with. 
Uh, when I decided to buy that, then I, I you know, sacrificed and said, all right, maybe I'll just get one or two knives. But when I saw these, I knew I had to have them. So these are outdoor edge knives, all right? These are specifically for hunting and skinning. The game skinner here, which is the bigger brother to the whitetail skinner, this was Outdoor Edge's first knife, all right? I'm actually gonna read something to you real quick, uh, which is interesting about this, and the company itself. So on Outdoor Edge's website, they were celebrating their 30th anniversary. This is what it says. This year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary, founder and owner David Bloch, it's B-L-O-C-H, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, it might be bloke or bloach, I don't know. Anyway, I'm gonna say Bloch. <laughs> David Bloch debuted Outdoor Edge's first product, the Game Skinner which is this exact knife, all right? An Ulu style skinny knife at SHOT Show in Las Vegas, January 1988. So this knife is from 1988. It says Blotch created the knife uh, as his senior design project while attending the Colorado School of Mines. After graduating with an engineering degree in 1986, Blotch refined the design, sought a manufacturer facility in Japan and began production. All right, so when we look at the back of the knife here, I zoom in, and it's on both knives. You can see Seiki City, Japan. Well, it says Seiki, Japan. All right, and patent pending. That's on both knives here. All right, and as we know today, it's a very, very big place for cutlery. Obviously, a lot of people are more familiar with Spyderco using Seiki City, Japan, and their VG10. All right, so really cool, you know, history on these knives. Now, when I got these, they were pretty beat. Okay, these were basically purchased, used a handful of times, carried when they went out hunting, and kind of neglected. All right, so I did a full refurbishing job on both of these. I cleaned everything up, got all the surface rust off the blades. Luckily, there's no pitting. There's a little staining here and there, if you guys can tell. Sharpen these things up. These are very, very comfortable handles. All right, very cool push dagger style uh, knife and again as I just read it's an Ulu style so you see there's tons and tons of belly here you can use this for food prep all kinds of stuff but then of course they have the gut hooks on the back which you would use you know obviously for gutting and you know opening up an animal if need be the sheaths themselves were pretty beat as well I completely treated the leather I polished up all the brass this particular one I did a, a separate video on because the button snap was broken all right so you'll see that video but I was able to repair that which is very, very cool. And I'm just really happy with these finds. I love the history. Outdoor Edge, I've talked about a bunch of times. I think they're an extremely, extremely underrated uh, knife company. Obviously, they make some other products as well, but some of their folders are awesome. You guys know I love the Leduc neck knife. You know, a couple of their uh, machetes, uh, the Brush Demon, just really, really cool products. Definitely worth looking into, and they do make some, you know, more affordable stuff. It's, you're not gonna pay, you know, $200 for one of their knives. So let me know down in the comment section if you guys are into black powder rifles and, and pistols and such. I mean, this really got the juices flowing on historical guns. I never really gave them too much focus. Uh, obviously, there's a ton of modern guns that I want. Uh, but to be honest, now that I have the black powder stuff, a lot of the accessories and such, I might want to get into uh, a pistol or something. It's just, it's really, really cool. I'll tell you that I'm so into it right now, I ended up putting the Patriot on yesterday randomly because it popped in my head. Uh, Mel Gibson movie. So anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for watching guys. Hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you tomorrow with a brand new video. Take care